So, um, welcome. Thank you for joining us on the first ever Advanced Primate um, Expert Series. And so what we're going to be doing um, from now to the infinity and beyond is creating uh, videos to help um, our customers and anyone that's out there looking to get more involved in the outdoors. Um, we're going to provide information from experts that will help you um, jump in, dive in, and not be overwhelmed uh, with the potential amount of things you may need to learn or skills you might need to, to possess uh, in order to do it. And so my name is Tim uh, Schiffer. I am the founder and CEO of AdvancedPrimate.com. It is an outdoor retailer. Uh, aim to make the outdoors more accessible to all and we have um, awesome things for backpacking, hiking, and camping uh, as well as many other outdoor activities that you um, can enjoy. Sitting here to my left is also Tim. Tim, please introduce yourself. Hello, I'm Tim Smith. Uh, I'm now a high school teacher, but before that I used to work in land conservation in the, primarily in the Oregon Cascades, but also up in the Washington Cascades and uh, all of Idaho. Cool. So, Tim, what does um, land conservation look like to someone that maybe never did it before? I mean, it sounds like you're conserving the land, but like, really, what are those what are those things like? What do you do? Yeah, um, another way that you could talk about land conservation is land stewardship. So, let's say that you are a landowner and you've got a fence that you need rebuilt. You might hire a company like the company that I work for or companies that I work for to rebuild a fence. That's a pretty small example the companies that I work for primarily built trail maintained trail um, built new trail um, did what was called a log out so every year snow and wind knocks trees down and covers the trail sure um, and that can get pretty thick um, especially when trees are falling on trees are falling on trees it looks like pickup sticks <laughs> and we come in and we clear out miles and miles and miles of trail okay and uh, with chainsaws if we're in the front country or if we're in legal wilderness, uh, mechanized devices are illegal to use. So we use crosscut saws and axes, just like wow. the oldie days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, that sounds like a pretty um, unique and uh, job that requires a lot of endurance. So is that like a, a job that you do as a volunteer, or is that a job that you can do as like a living? Uh, both, actually. Um, you'll never be a rich man if you do it for a living. <laughs> Uh, but you will be rich in experiences. Yeah. Um, but there are many, many volunteer programs throughout the summer um, that you can sign up for all over the Western United States. And there's a lot here in uh, Boise, specifically. Like the oh, foothills yeah. that are right here. The Boise foothills, the Ridge River system is a great example. Um, a lot of the folks that work that are professionals that are heavily augmented, as far as I know still, um, with the uh, volunteer work. Cool. Very cool. So um, Tim is what we would... Um, considered to be an expert in the outdoors. He's also taught a lot of classes to uh, kids about like survival or if you can elaborate a little bit on that. Yeah, um, one of the companies that I worked for um, was a land conservation and education outreach program for youth. Um, so my job as a crew leader was to teach children, young people, um, 14 to about 16 years old, okay. how to not only work in the woods, but also how to conserve the land, how to do the work, and how to survive day to day, and uh, make make good choices and <laughs> enjoy the tangible endpoints and natural consequences of those choices. Awesome. So just like you want to teach all children, really, so yes. with an outdoor twist. Uh, yeah, you know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> great. It sounds great. So, uh, and then in your free time, you are an outdoorsy type person, and it is backpacking, hiking, camping, or all things. Yeah, as much as we can be. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Well, which right now this happens to be being filmed uh, uh, during the um, the COVID year, so mm -hmm. um, there's not a lot you can do in town. But the outdoors is pretty much always available in the super social distance, mm -hmm. which is a, a good thing if you're a person that either is already out, have an outdoors person, or you're really looking to get into it. And um, so mm -hmm. it's a good thing to talk about and learn about today. Yeah. Okay. So what we're going to talk about today is backpacking. So this is uh, really going to be you probably, if you're getting into backpack, maybe you're brand new to the outdoors, but really, um, and I'll let Tim elaborate, um, I've done some light uh, hiking and camping. I've done some decent hiking um, and camping, uh, but I've never actually done like a five-day backpacking trek uh, where you go in, you know, several miles in the wilderness and then you camp uh, and then you come back out. So 
what we're gonna do today is we're gonna talk about what a person that's never done that before uh, might need to know um, about backpacking uh, a little bit more seriously than, than uh, what you might need to know before you undertake something like that. So it, it obviously, it starts with hiking. It's really the combination of, of hiking and camping and one thing where you carry your stuff uh, and you bring it back with you. Um, so before we get too far into that, Tim, you backpack. Mm -hmm. What got you into it? Probably my family. Okay. Um, I grew up camping and fishing and hunting, and then uh, I backpacked a lot in Boy Scouts. Oh. And it was just a huge part of my life growing up. And Cool. And so you carried that on? Yeah, I carried it on. Um, fell into it uh, during the financial crash. Uh, yeah. Had no idea that I was going to become a land conservationist for a while. <laughs> Um, life is unexpected and weird and, uh, it worked out. It worked out very well. Cool. So, um, should we start with, uh, I mean, how would you, how would you approach this topic if you were to teach somebody? You know, we'll make sure I'm not, I'm not missing. Mm -hmm. So why would somebody want to get into backpacking? Let's answer that question first. Maybe you're sitting here and you're watching this video and you're like, well, backpacking sounds cool. And it's definitely something I do right now, but like, I'm not really sure. Why would, why would you get into it? What's great about backpack? What do you love about it? The quiet. Um, I can totally agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> the peace, uh, right? The peace. It's, yeah, if you yeah. get out there, it's it's very quiet. Um, you can see beautiful views from a parking lot. Um, Stanley, Idaho would be a great example of beautiful views from a parking lot. Stanley, Idaho. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm sure it's all over right yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, But there's so much more to see beyond the parking lot. And that's... The trailhead. The, yeah. And that's one of the things that's so nice about backpacking is um, it makes you feel small. You're tiny out there. And there's something really... Spiritual? I was going to say wondrous, but spiritual as well. It gives you a sense of place. Yeah, uh, in the universe, exactly. So to speak. Um, you are very, very small and very insignificant out there, and um, it really puts a lot of things into perspective. And That's a cool way to put it. When you come back into the the real world, as we would call it over here in civilization, sure. Um, everything that bugs you has the uh, has the sound turned down. Yeah. And what doesn't matter slides. So it's therapeutic. Uh, it gives you a purpose. I would agree with all of those things. One of my that's. My favorite thing about being in the outdoors, is it's as it's as authentic uh, as life gets, mm -hmm. you know. And when you're when you live in the city or um, in, you know, like Boise's a city, you know, you live in LA, or it's a big city. But when you live in a, in, a, in a civilization, there's all these rules and priorities and things you're supposed to do and um, you know ways you're supposed to act. And those things are all great. Mm -hmm. It helps us all get along. Yes. But really, uh, you know, when you're out in nature, it really is just like this is this is a, this is the world. As yeah, as it can be, right? Mm -hmm. The set of rules are laid pretty bare at that point because the rules that you're following are rules that keep you alive, and keep yeah. the wilderness safe. Yeah, I mean you're surviving. I mean in, in a literal sense by by the, the proper nourishment and hydration mm -hmm. uh, and um, you know shelter, creating your own shelter. And then there's the danger of like bears, you know, mm -hmm. or, or whatever else happens to be in whatever environment you're in. Exactly. Because you could be camping in the desert, you know, or, or whatever. Here we have mountains. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and the the rules, like the the social patterns that we have, that when we set up camp or when we cook, and like how we cook, where we cook in relation to where our tent is or our sleeping bag, sure. uh, where we put our food when we're done with it or we're not using it, like all that's built in around protecting us from the bears, but also the bears from people, because if they become inclined to people, unfortunately they'll start seeking people out, and it's obviously not usually a good thing for the people. No, and not for the bears either, because a lot of the time those bears, unfortunately, if relocation doesn't work, they have to be destroyed because yeah. they become a menace. Which is an unfortunate uh, you know, ending to that. Yeah, and it's something that people, it's a problem that people caused. And we can avoid it. And it is completely avoidable. Yeah. Okay, so um, that's why you get into backpacking, so you can experience life authentic. Yeah. Um, so... You know, I think that's really why you would get into it. I think probably most people, uh, and you can agree, disagree, if, um, but I, I mean, I think most people have hiked, right? At some point, mm -hmm. you've gone to a park and walked up a hill. I mean, that's like, yeah. I mean, it's, that's probably a hike. I mean, it's not like a hike, like, 
you know, a four mile hike to an alpine lake, but I mean, most people have hiked, right? Well, it really depends on what you call hiking. Like, All right, let's define hiking then real quick because that's part of, it's a small thing in backpacking because it's mm -hmm. an assumption that you're doing that. Well, if we turn it back, like, if you go to a park without a paved pathway and you're walking around for a few hours, is that hiking? No, that's a walk. It's a walk? I was, well, I don't know. <laughs> let's, not, let's not go too tangential here, but let's mm -hmm. discuss. What would you call it? I don't know. Hiking is just walking and enjoying the scenery. And Do you feel like there has to be terrain involved for it to be a hike? No. Okay, because I always no. feel like, you know, walking on a path in a park that has woods or whatever, um, that's walking on a path. I assume that hiking, there has to be an incline or a decline at some point in both, and maybe mm -hmm. many of them. Um, but maybe I'm wrong. You know, it's probably up to the it's probably up to the beholder, but yeah. there are plenty of trails that don't go through mountainous terrain. You know, sure. maybe they start in the desert and you're still, you know, it's flat ground, but it's still you and your surroundings. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, so hiking is anything you want it to be. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's over a period of time uh, without um, a car, a bike, or a motorcycle. You're using mm -hmm. your feet. Let's call it that. So backpacking is the literal definition. Hiking and camping overnight because you're carrying mm -hmm. something to sleep with you, right? Yeah. So, what are the um, essentials? Um, if you wanted to set out on a backpacking uh, trip and it was your first time, so we're going to preface it with the first time. Um, what What are the, like the kind of the big things, you know, gear? Um, you know, besides the gear, which we can get mm -hmm. into, I think, in more detail, it's important. But besides that, what What else would you need to consider? Um, always consider the weather. Uh, always consider your elevation. Um, always, if especially if it's closer to July, August, uh, always, always, always double check uh, the fire conditions mm. um, with the ranger station in the district that you're going to be camping in or hiking in. So how do you do? How do you check the fire? So you, you don't just go to the internet. You go like that. You can go to like a ranger station. You can check the internet. Um, it's easier to. Uh, use the telephone and just call the ranger station. Oh, so you can find them though. Yeah, oh yeah. Um, you can use the internet to find them. And The thing is, is not all of those uh, places in. necessarily have the most updated internet information. Sure. Uh, versus if they've got some, like if there's an actual fire going on live right then that's not been reported yet on the internet, they might be able to tell you like right away. Cool, so Forest Service website has yep, a listing Forest Service of, website. of, uh, mm -hmm. of the uh, ranger stations. And and that's a great tip right there that I think most people wouldn't, I wouldn't think to do that, mm -hmm. but it makes perfect sense. Yeah, and so, they'll also... And they probably like to hear from you. Oh right? yeah, they always want to talk to people. <laughs> you probably um, pick up some more tips by calling the ranger. Mm -hmm. you know? They'll be able to tell you things too, like uh, whether or not a fire, in a fire ring is permitted at that time of the year for that particular district. Great information. Um, which is, yeah, nothing ruins a trip like uh, finding out and getting a ticket. Um, because you had a fire that was not permitted yeah, yeah. due to the fire conditions. Yeah, yeah. So very important first step. I guess second step, if you if you kind of figure out, you've got to figure out your location before you know what yep. ranger to call. Mm -hmm. So uh, what are the kinds of things that you would look for? Uh, and I don't want to get off track. We're still talking about, you know, you want to go on your first packing, back, packing trip. These are the things you want to talk about. So, or you want to, you want to consider before you do it. So contact the, the, the Forest Service ranger for that location yep. to figure out those conditions and whether or not you get in the fire rather than getting a ticket. But to figure out where you're gonna go, mm -hmm. what what are considerations for a new, I mean, like, are we talking like a two-nighter or, or a one-night? I mean, for a beginner. So you wanna go to a place mm -hmm. that's probably relatively accessible, not super challenging. Yeah, I would pick an area, um, if you've done day hiking, I would probably stick in the area that you're familiar with, um, just in case you become disoriented or something happens. Sure. Um, if a mistake is made or you become injured or an animal gets into your you know, stuff in the middle of the night, you yep. need to, to leave, the more familiar you are with the area, the, the safer that you're going to be if you need to. Absolutely. So um, if you've hiked anywhere, you've lived where you've lived for a long time, yeah. um, go where you're familiar. And if you're new to your area, you know, talk to somebody local that you trust mm -hmm. um, to find out where those yeah. kind of places might mm -hmm. be. Right? Where's, where's the place where I'm not too far if I gotta run? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right? Okay. Uh, bring a friend. Don't uh, go alone. Don't go alone. First time, tandem jump. Uh, tandem <laughs> jump first time. Yeah, okay. Um, it can be another newbie. Yeah. Um, doesn't have to be. Yeah. Um, somebody with also with camping experience. Uh, if you're going with somebody more experienced, all the better. But yeah. yeah. It doesn't have to be an outdoor 
probably really helpful. It, it is extremely helpful. I would say it's helpful. probably less, it's probably more rare that two people, well, you know, I don't know. Two people have never done backpacking might go, let's take a backpacking trip and go on a total adventure together because we'll be figuring out as we mm-hmm. go. So that maybe does happen. And maybe that's you right now. And if it is, I think that's awesome. Yep. Keep watching. And if something happens to you, your friend can go do something about that. If something happens to your friend, you can go do something about that. Which so is really the big, the big it's, thing. It's always the backup system. You yeah. always have a redundancy. Great. For everything, not just humans. <laughs> yes. Oh, exactly. <laughs> okay. Everything has a redundancy. Cool. So everything has a redundancy. Um, so you've, you've, we've talked about location, and then when you know where you're going to go, figure out the forest ranger and call them mm-hmm. um, on the, uh, the National Forest Service website, mm-hmm. uh, U.S. Forest Service, right? What is it? U- uh, uh, what are the, what's the acronym? Uh, the USFS. F-S, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, I was going to say that. I don't that right. Okay. Probably that order. So they're not technically that. part of the Department of Agriculture, but yes. I don't think anybody cares. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... You know the location, you know the conditions, mm-hmm. uh, duration. Let's talk about how long you should go on your first one. And, and, and these are all just you can go as long as you want or as short as you want, right? But like, what would you say? Uh, for your first time, um, especially if you're with somebody else who is, is also their first time, I'd recommend one night. Um, mm-hmm. Just in and out. Um, we survive. <laughs> exactly. Right? And that way there's no pressure to keep going. I mean, it's, it's a really good practice to always, you know, reflect on, what went well and what didn't go well. Less so hard. if you're building on that like one night idea rather than pushing it, yeah. it gives you time to think about what worked, what didn't work, what would make me more comfortable next time. Absolutely. What worked for me? Did my friend drive me crazy? <laughs> Do I like this I, guy? Right, because what you're stuck out there for a number of days, I mean. He's the only person to talk to. There's yeah. no cell reception, so yeah. what else are you going to do? Yeah, you find out, you learn something you, you don't like about each other, mm-hmm. and you're stuck. So. so one night, first time one night. I, w- I would recommend one night. A couple miles in, couple miles out uh yeah and you know there's there's lakes that you can access that are a mile hike in um people treat them like a day hike which yeah. is fine you go in have lunch come back out sure. there's nothing that says that you can't walk in and put up camp if you're sure. if you're in the national forest and you're not in the campground uh it is legal to camp anywhere that you want to cool as long as it's not an active logging site right and you wouldn't probably want to be there anyway absolutely not that's dangerous <laughs> <laughs> So hopefully they're uh, well marked uh, by signs. Uh, they will, and then you'll hear the saws. And they will, yeah. if they find you, they will chase you off. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, we'll Politely. Us. Yeah, polite, of course. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Even though you're in the forest and really anything goes, it's another thing to remember. Um, yes. So, um, so we got a location, we got a duration. Mm-hmm. Um, we have the kind of the pre-work you should do as far as the conditions and what you yep. can do when you're there. So um, I guess the next thing is probably equipment. Yeah. Um, before we dive into equipment, the very last thing, most important thing, tell somebody who's not coming with you exactly where you're going, when you're going there, and when you're supposed to be back. That is a really important point. Because if you don't, with the understanding that if you don't come back or communicate within a specific time window, that they're going to call that ranger station and let them know that you haven't checked in at the agreed upon time, and that they are concerned. Because at that point, you know, hour, hours save. Literally. Hours right. save lives. Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. So, very important point. So, um, equipment. Yeah, so let's talk about equipment. So, yeah. you know, I've heard that there's the 10 backpacking essentials. Um, uh, I think the number is probably arbitrary. I think when I start going through my list of things that I would want to have um, or, you know, would, would be helpful versus banging two rocks together to, you know, create a fire. Um, you know, there's a list of probably, it's probably less than 15 things that you would want to bring inside your backpack. And for the backpack itself, mm-hmm. I've always thought it was most important to, if you don't have a backpack yet, you're going you're gonna to have to get one for this. Um, because the great thing about the outdoors is there's no cover charge, you know, like there is in town when you go someplace cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there is a little bit of a barrier to entry and that you need to collect some things that you're going to need. One of those things is the pack. I always thought that you should get the pack after you know what, you're gonna, what your other things are. So that you don't get a pack and then you go, oh, well, half my crap doesn't fit. So let's talk about things, and then one of the things is the pack, and Mm -hmm. what would you say about a backpack? Backpacks are actually really personal. Um, Different brands will fit you differently, just like shoes. Mm -hmm. Um, The most important thing that you can do with a backpack is try on several different brands and see which one feels better for you. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a shorter torso um, with broader shoulders for my height, so there's a specific backpack brand that really, really, it's, it's very 
It's probably one of the most popular brands in the country, and it is very uncomfortable. Huh. Um, I have tried so hard to make that pack work because they're always on sale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Last year's model. <laughs> and, and, and because it's very popular, so there's a, there's a lot of them. There's a lot right? of them, yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there's also a lot of replacement parts for them, which is really helpful. Yeah. Uh, fortunately, one of their nearer competitors um, makes a backpack frame that fits my specific human shape really well. Awesome. But if you don't have a frame like mine, um, a buddy of mine who's very tall and lean hates it. He says it feels like there's a fist in the small of his back just pushing on him constantly. Sure, and for me, sitting at the wrong spot. Yeah, and for me, it's like a little hug yeah. from <laughs> letting Perfect me know he's still example. there. So we do have backpacks at advancedprimate.com, uh, and I would definitely encourage you to buy backpacks from us. Uh, mm -hmm. But it is really important to um, make sure that that backpack is comfortable. And yep. how how would you free returns? By the way, if you don't like your backpack, we'll take it back. Get your mm -hmm. money back. Uh, we'll even pay for return shipping. But how would you, like, I, I know everybody defines comfort in their own way, and it's comfortable, but how long do you need to, like, because you can put on a new pair of shoes and walk, you know, 10 times, and go, oh, yep. these are comfortable, but after, like, a mile, you're like, oh, man, you know, how long do you need to, before you know that it's going to be comfortable? Um, you'll be able to tell pretty early on. Um, 10 just, minutes? Just walk yeah, around? Yeah, just um, put some weight in there. Um, oh, good, good call. Uh, so grab something else nearby. Yeah, like grab some cans out of your pantry and throw them in there. You don't need to fill the whole thing up, but yeah. just, you know, get 20 pounds in there. Yeah. And walk around, and if you feel it pinching, if you feel it, like, if it's rubbing somewhere that you don't want a backpack to be rubbing anywhere that you know would really be a bother to you, yeah. that might be a sign that it might not be the pack for you. Um, another question is how long are you going to be wearing that pack? Because if you're, if you're starting to do like, overnight backpacking trips... You might be walking in a couple miles. You might be walking for an hour, maybe two hours or so. Sure. Um, so another question is, you know, is this something that you can put up with for two hours? Yeah. Um, or even longer, right? Yeah, exactly. at some point you're going to level up. And you're going to be wearing and, it for four, yeah. five, six, eight hours, right? As you level up, you get yeah. in a relationship with your pack, and you start to know all these weird quirks and creaks. And so it's true. I know everybody here watching has something that they're really into in their life that, mm -hmm. that they feel that way about. And so... What, what, what message is being conveyed here by Tim is that this is the same kind of thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's, um, it's a personal yeah. thing. So as you level up, your relationship with your backpack levels up, too. I like it. Yep. <laughs> Hopefully you don't chew on it or whatever like you do. Your, your no, I mean, <laughs> by, by the end of my career in land conservation, I, I referred to my backpack as old friend. Oh, I like it. How long have you had your longest backpack that you still use? Uh, the last backpack that I got... I still have it, and I pray every time that I use it that it will stay in one uh, piece. It's like your the favorite t-shirt kind of thing. Yep. It yeah. is yeah. like my favorite t-shirt. <laughs> it is covered in old chainsaw oil and wants to fall apart, oh, man. and I will not let it. Um, would you patch it, or would you just let it go? Have you patched it? Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, at this point, it would probably be time to find a new one. Wow. Um, but I've had that pack since... 2010. It's a great investment. How many times did you think you used it? Hey, uh, I wore that backpack for probably about a 110, 120 days out of the year for years. Wow, that's pretty good. Um, so one of the things about uh, hiking or backpacking backpacks you'll find, uh, if you haven't already started looking at it, I assume you have, is they're not like the price of like a, a Jan Sport pack, for example. You usually have a higher barrier of entry. But if you're using it, not barrier of entry, price point. Um, but the value is there, especially if you're gonna be able to use it for like um, I mean, literally thousands of hours, right? Oh I mean, yeah, oh yeah. That breaks down to like pennies per hour mm -hmm. of enjoyment, really. And, and so, mine was very overloaded a yeah. lot of the time because yeah. we were on longer excursions, you know, yeah. two weeks, two and a half weeks or so. Totally. Um, so I'm sure it has odors. Oh, <laughs> it's in the garage for a reason. The, the musky scent is probably part of the reason you love it. It's so familiar. The, the so. delightful bouquet is half the joy. <laughs> totally. Uh, so you know, what I would say though, if they're considering, if they're balking at the price of a pack, what I would say is, if you are, if this is something that you know that you want to invest in, and. Uh, you're able to get out. You work a nine to five job. Um, you're able to get out on weekends during the summer, like or even like the late spring into the early fall. 
Yeah. Um, let's say you're a super warrior and you can do that like two weekends out of four weekends in a month. Yeah. So that's, you're going what, eight times? Yeah. Ten times? Yeah. Uh, in a year? Yeah. So. Weekends. Yeah, weekends. Right. In and out. But what would that cost? To do anything else, right? And oh, have, yeah. And have a, a hotel mm -hmm. or whatever, you know I mean? Yeah, so if you take care of the pack and if it's being, if that's the way it's being used and it's not being used commercially, yeah. that pack will last you yeah, your right. lifetime. It'll, it'll last until the nylon starts to break down. And these days the materials are phenomenal. So yeah. I mean, it's a long time, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so my earlier um, thought to not get your pack uh, necessarily until you know what your stuff is going to be, probably is still somewhat valuable. But, but if you're going to go, I think Tim's, Tim's knowledge here and um, his point is, is definitely more salient. Uh, in that your backpack needs to be something you really uh, enjoy having on you and doesn't have any pressure points or isn't mm -hmm. rubbing, you know, in a certain way. And so does that mean, um, before we move to the, my, what I was just going to get to, was, which was the, the size, how big should the interior compartment be, uh, you know, you need, a, you, need a hip, you need the hip strap and the sternum strap. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, you need some, some load uh, distributor. The, the adjusters. Yeah. yeah. So you want some of those. So what, what kinds of... Um, I mean, is that the three things you want? Something um, as far as making it stay put when you're moving around. So, the I'm trying to figure out how to say this succinctly. No. Um, so backpacks are measured in liters. Yes. Uh, anything about forty liters or above, like a forty liter pack, would do you okay if you're doing an ultralight overnight type of excursion, mm -hmm. um, especially for a shorter hike. Yeah. Um, you can easily get away with multiple nights, like two, three nights in a 65 liter pack, um, which is kind of that next bump up. Which puts the pack about the top of your head behind you, right? Depending on how you load it and what's in there. Sure. Um, we can talk, we'll talk about that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, the, I'd say that the main points about the, the strap systems on the packs are, obviously you've got your shoulder straps that hold it on your back. Yeah. Um, your hip belt, actually is to take the load off of your shoulders specifically so to, so, to balance it down a little bit actually your pack once you cinch it down correctly should feel like it's sitting up a little bit yes and about 90 percent of that weight is going to be sitting directly on top of your hips okay um the upside is, is it won't jiggle side to side either because of the belt but its primary function is to take the weight off of your shoulders okay because a fully loaded pack if it's sitting on your shoulders the entire time is going to wear you down really fast yeah yeah, totally. Um, and it's just, it's deeply uncomfortable. I've, Which is the main thing we're I've hiked with a broken belt before, and it is less than desirable. Yeah, understood. So, so you want the, the waist belt. The sternum mm -hmm. strap, do you need that? It's helpful. Yeah, I mean, it just seems to be another point to keep it from moving around and creating friction and causing a sore or some sort of It poison. is. It keeps your straps forward, which yeah. keeps the load further against your back. Yeah. Rather than, as, it, as the uh, straps might spread out. Your backpack will start to lean you get backwards. that separation yeah yeah and the more everybody's so, done in yeah school, exactly the backpack hanging down and touching your, your lower back and, yeah well and if it's sitting on top of your hips and then it starts separating back yeah if this is fully loaded the further back it is the more you're fighting it yeah so the sternum strap is really there you're leaking energy as another yeah as, again for energy conservation yeah you're you can work with your gear you can fight your gear and so then the load balancers which are just the straps you can pull to make the top of the pack come closer to your back? Um, it pulls the whole thing. Everything's articulating off of your waist. Yeah. So it'll pull it forward. Most sure. people prefer to hike at, you know, at a forward at lean. a forward angle. Yeah. Um, yeah. So really all you're doing is calibrating, like, where where do you want your load to sit on you? Where does it feel like that center of gravity is being found? Yeah. And that changes every day, every hour. Um, as you hike, your your gear will shift and yeah. settle inside the pack. So it's always a good idea to be checking on those. Yeah. Stop, ask yourself, am I fighting my pack? Yeah, yeah, yeah. all good stuff. So you want you want to be able to make sure the pack is, is tight to your person with the straps, uh, both the hip and the sternum, mm -hmm. and then also have the load balancing straps that allow you to adjust, um, keep the pack close to your, your back and not, not coming away um, and causing you to burn energy unnecessarily. Mm -hmm. So um, the size of the pack that you want to use, you said 40, 40 is probably about as small as you want to go in. 40 is a pretty big pack if you've never had like a hiking pack and you just used like commuter packs um, for, for work or you, you ride the train or you yeah. know for school, college, high school, whatever. 
Uh, 40 liters is bigger than most people have used before. Yeah. Um, by a decent amount, right? I mean, probably almost 20 liters is probably a commuter pack, right? Mm, like 20, 25. Okay. So it's noticeably bigger. And to go bigger than that, like 65. Yeah. I mean, that's it, it, the look of a backpack. I mean, by the time you get to 65 liters, this is this is a dedicated purpose-built pack. Yeah. Um, for, you can, you for can live out of this kind of thing. Yes, exactly. And also carry it with you places and not get too tired to keep going. Exactly. Right. It's designed to work with you over long distances. So 40 is the entry if you just want to get started and you don't think you're going big for a while because mm -hmm. that will last you for a long time. It's Six also a great day pack. If you if you also want to double up, you don't want to take a 60 liter pack. It's too big and for day hike. It, it, for a day hike, it is a very yeah. large pack. So that makes a, sense. a 40 liter might be a nice beginner point for somebody because um, it, it's a great day pack. It's got enough room for a picnic and a first aid kit. Cool. So that pretty much covers it for um, the backpack itself. Yes. So let's talk about, um, the next thing we should talk about is the things that you need to go inside of your backpack. So yeah, 40 liters is the smallest you want to get, 65 is probably a better, uh, bigger pack. Yeah, and for your first pack, do not get taught, packs go all the way up to like 85, 95, up to 120 liters. Do not talk yourself- Do 120 yourself, liters on your first pack. Do not talk yourself into anything more than 70-ish. On the first one. The You're going to want to put more things in there than you need. And everything that you don't need, you're just wasting energy. Which is another great lesson you can learn when backpacking is how to be a little bit more minimalist in the lifestyle, mm -hmm. right? Just what you need, and you'll find that you can be just as happy, if not happier, with, with less. Yep. Um, just so, never forget that you're going to have to carry it back out. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Everything you pack is going to uh, mm -hmm. seem a lot heavier, individually little things, after several hours in and then back out. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about like um, you know, the things that you need when you go um, out. So um, I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples. I know you don't need me to get it rolling, let me get the ball rolling. So you need navigation, a compass, and a map. Uh, yes. Uh, you know, Even if you know where you're going. A headlamp, mm -hmm. you know, things like that. Yeah, light source, headlamps are great um, because you, it gives you both hands free. Uh, even if you know where you're going, even if you're familiar with the trail, have a map with you. Um, I've had friends that were on a familiar trail who had to do hiking at night, which is not ideal, but it was not an ideal situation. Uh, they knew the terrain, uh, they were familiar with it, they'd been there before, and they managed to completely miss the spur trail, kept on walking, and by the time they knew something was wrong, if they didn't have a map, they wouldn't have been able to locate where they were and figure out how to correct their error. So yeah. always bring a map. And so not only just bring a map, but make sure you understand how to read a map. And I, that, so I've uh, done cartography professionally for a long time. Uh, I don't today, but I have in the past. Um, and that is like a, an art form and a science. Mm -hmm. And I know it's just a map and you can look at a map and maps of cities are really easy. Um, but without spending a bunch of time on this, because we are trying to cover the whole backpacking in, in this kind of one episode, um, which may be multiple parts by the time it's done. And this could be part two already. We'll find out when, when we touch this and edit. Yeah. Uh, but so, what are the simple things that you need to know about a map if you're going to read a map um, of the wilderness? Just a, uh, two or three things. And maybe it's just the things to make you go look for those things to learn more about them, mm -hmm. uh, but just to get started. Um, talk to the Forest Service to, to make sure that you're getting a map of the area that you're going to be in. Um, you can get atlases, which are extremely helpful for you know navigating up to a point. Um, but if you're... It, if you're going to be in an area for a prolonged amount of time, or you're again you're unfamiliar with the terrain, make sure that the map that you have is specific to the area that you're in to get greater accuracy in the features that are around you, just mountains, trails, streams. Hey, I'm just trying to get away. <laughs> oh yeah, um, mountains, trails, streams. Mountains, trails, streams. Uh, be familiar with the legend, like know know the scale of the map, so. As you're you looking figure at this, out distance, yeah. yeah, like how, what, what does this distance actually represent? Cool. And then understand the contour system. Cool. Like, yeah, yeah, the, the topography. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, as you could well attest to, the the closer the lines are together, the steeper the terrain. Correct. The further apart the lines are, the more space there is. The more space. Literally, there is. space on the ground between the lines. Yeah, yeah, and not every map represents those lines the same way. Sometimes it 
could be 50 feet sure. from line to line. And it should stay on the contour. It, you may need does. a magnifying glass yeah. to read it. <laughs> but uh, especially if you're, you know, in your 40s and you're getting to that reading glasses. Yeah, I'd say that's the big three. They're like, make sure that your map covers the area that you're in. Understand. Um, I've been sent to areas with a map that was not to the <laughs> quadrant that I was in. Valid, valid. Um, so it was a wonderful, beautiful map. It uh, was not helpful. Yeah. Um, we used it as a fire starter. Okay. Uh, which was great. Back up for a bad map, kindling. Yep. Back up for a bad map, kindling. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, redundancy. Yeah, exactly. There's uh, that word again. Yep. Okay, and then the last thing is the contours. The last thing is the contours. All right, so besides uh, navigation, which is a compass and a map, a compass for direction, and you can't use your phone for these things nowadays. Like, there's great apps out there, like like All Trails. I would, and those work without the internet. Mm -hmm. However, Tim's going to tell you probably not to use your phone as your go-to source, or at least have redundancy. Your phone should be a backup only. Really important because you might be watching this on your phone and thinking that you could just use your phone, and it is potentially good as a flashlight uh, or whatever. But you're not going to have a place to plug it in. Maybe you got a charger. Yeah, like carry that in and out. Or if it is dropped, maps are a lot more durable than a phone, unfortunately. Technology can fail, and, yep. and, and, and the map can also fail, but um, it's way more attractive. So I usually have my map, and I'll use my phone to take a picture of the, the map at the trailhead yeah. as well, a backup. It's great. So if my tank catches on fire somehow, and my map catches on fire, yeah. I have that a backup. It. Yeah. So uh, sun protection, some way to start fire. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people just will take a lighter. I use a lighter. But you can get waterproof matches. Um, Those are wonderful. That they're are great. They're small, they're compact, they're lightweight. Mm -hmm. They will they will excuse me, light when wet, you know. So they yep. they um, another solid substitute. You can get fire strikers which which we have on advancedprimate.com. Um, and waterproof matches uh, as well. So mm -hmm. uh, those are ways to start a fire. Um, you obviously need shelter, you need hydration, yes. you need nutrition. Let's mm -hmm. talk about some other things and I'll make sure that we don't um, maybe leave off anything and go yeah. pick this here. But. So, what else? Okay, so we covered, we mentioned that you need a shelter. Yeah, so we shelter. What's shelter. the shelter need to look like? You don't want an eight person tent. No. You just don't want to carry it. Uh, you don't want that, and also an eight person tent will not keep your body heat close to you. Ah, so uh, if you're claustrophobic, <laughs> um, I'd say if you're claustrophobic, <laughs> uh, get a if it's just you, get a tent for get a three person backpacking tent, and it will fit you and your backpack comfortably. Okay. Did you hear that? One more time. If you're claustrophobic, get a three person backpacking tent. There you go. And it'll fit you and your backpack comfortably. A one person tent or a two person tent. A one person tent is essentially slightly bigger than your bag, right? Your sleeping bag. Uh, well, there's several ways to go with that. Um, um, yeah. Um, oh, Again, yeah, we could get really detailed, and we'll, there will be a uh, more detailed um, intermediate and expert level mm -hmm. video that we'll do, Tim and I will do, uh, but for this one, we're going to try and keep it moving, but I, yeah. I do want to talk about some of these things. So, a one person, what's that look like so, when you're wearing it? Let's because just start I'm guessing you've never tried one. I yeah. don't have one. There's a, the extreme at one end is the a bivy sack, which is essentially a weatherproof sarcophagus for your sleeping bag. Yep. I hate to call it a sarcophagus, but when you go to sleep... That screen or cover over your face is about that far away from your face. So if you're claustrophobic, it's not ideal. If or even an option, probably. Yeah, <laughs> if you're trying to save weight and save room, um, there are plenty of good baby sacks out there. Uh, one person tents are great. Uh, two person is kind of a, a comfortable place, especially if you're gonna be in rain, like in the Orkney Cascades. For two, for two people? Um, no. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You can get two people into a two-person tent. It's not comfortable. Yeah. Um, but if you want some space to roll around, you know, you might be in the rain. If it rains, um, it's nice to be able to sit up and to put your shirt on and your a rain shell on yeah, 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 before yeah. you get outside. Yeah. Versus a, a one-person or a baby sack, you're probably going to be dressing outside versus inside your tent. And, that's just and I would say that for a beginner first-timer, a, a two-person tent is probably as small as you want to go. I would say yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So a two-person tent, if it's just you and your own tent, mm -hmm. um, or it's someone that you don't mind being really close to, yep. um, a three-person tent will fit two people. Yes. And that's generally my rule with tents, is like, if I want four people in it, eight's a good number. You yeah. Know? Like an eight-person tent, because then it's yeah. a little more comfortable for four people. Mm -hmm. There's room to stand in the middle, you can have your beds, you know, things like that, or cots. Um, exactly. So, okay, so smallish tent is okay, one-person tent's probably out for a beginner. Um, you can do just a shelter too, right? Like you can just, if you want to go really light, you can have a, 
you know, find two trees and tie a string between one and the other and then make a tent shape. Uh, yeah, shelter. tarp shelter. Yeah. Um, tarp shelters work just fine. Um, if it's your first time out, it can leave you feeling a little bit exposed, which might make it hard to sleep because yeah. you're your brain's already going to be listening to everything around you constantly. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Every, I've like, never experienced that ever. I'm kidding. That's what I think about every time I go out there. <laughs> an animal this big is going to sound like a bear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if there's no walls at two ends of you, yeah, 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 yeah. you feel really exposed. You feel very exposed. It can it can really keep you up at night. I've had a lot really? of kids that have had that problem. I've had that problem before. Yeah. It turned out it was a deer. but You don't know at nighttime. Yeah, there's I've, no way of knowing. I've had a raccoon, uh, raccoon eating chips. Oh, yeah. I've had before, and it mm-hmm. sounded like, I don't know, a little devil. You know? Yeah. It really did. And I, <laughs> um, I'd recommend an enclosed three-person tent is great. Uh, first, first time, let's just pick one thing. So if there's yeah. two of you, enclosed three-person tent. Enclosed three-person tent. Yeah. Uh, do, even if you think it's not going to rain, put up the rain shell. Put the rain shell on. Yeah. Put the rain shell on. Just do it. Just do it. Okay. Uh, weather changes fast, especially in the middle of the night, and nobody likes waking up at 3 a.m. to a rainstorm when you... Don't have anything but mesh over top. When you swore it wasn't going to rain, yeah, and then yeah, yeah, it yeah. rains through your mesh all over your gear. Yeah, everything. Your, your clothes. But I've obviously never done that before. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So, so you need food, right? So, so yes. you get your backpack, you get your tent. Let's, let's actually talk sleeping bag first, and then do you need a pad? Yes. Two things. So you want a bag and a pad? Yes. Okay. Um, your bag is rated to a... Uh, it has a temperature rating. Um, very, very important. Pay actually. attention to the temperature rating. Um, and 40 degrees is not good enough. 20 or 30 is probably what I would minimum, right? Depending on where you're going. Um, but you can take the bag off. You can put more bag on. That's the way I think. You can, but if you're in... I would say that the... the well, I've uh, got a point of privilege here because I have a, a quiver of sleeping bags depending on where I'm going. Okay. Um, I do have very, very light sleeping bags for sleeping in warmer country or lower country. Yeah. Uh, the higher up you go, um, the thinner the air. Also, you lose typically about five, seven degrees in our neck of the woods for every thousand feet you go up. Okay. Good to know. Um, also important for you. Yeah. And then, you're looking at elevation, consider that. Yep. Uh, <clears throat> that gets amplified at nighttime. Um, one of my favorite spots, it'll be 100 degrees down here, and it will still get into the 40s at night up there. Yeah. Um, and you're not sharing that favorite spot. No. <laughs> it is beautiful though yeah yeah, yeah. Um, as should your favorite spot be indeed yeah. find your find your personal church that's right um, <laughs> but uh, I'd say if you're doing summer camping like middle of, which is a perfect time to go for your first time yeah um, a 40 to 60 degree bag should be fine depending on where you live uh, as we live in Idaho um, I typically shoot for about the 40 degree range um, for nighttime for me, for a summer sleeping bag. Um, for shoulder seasons, like fall and spring, um, I use my zero to negative six bag. Okay. Take those two. Mm-hmm. Um, so you, you, you want a pad. You, you want... You want a pad that can roll up, hopefully. Yes. And cinch underneath your pack or sit on the... It, it depends on what... It, so if you have a solid pad, which are perfectly fine pads, they're mm-hmm. they're very durable, they last a long time. Yeah. They tend to be bulkier and a little bit heavier. Is yeah. the only downside, but sure. they're durable. Sure. Um, they tend to roll up. Um, yeah. Inflatable pads tend to either wad up or roll up into a small section. Yeah. I store mine inside my sleeping bag yeah. just in case something snags my pack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the last thing to get punctured is that pad. Um, so you've got a whole sleeping bag around your inflatable yeah, protect, pad. Yeah, protecting your exactly. uh, Important items that are yeah. Punctured. See, there are no monotaskers in the woods. Exactly. Just everything does something while it's and not then doing something anything. else and something else and yep. maybe even a fifth thing if exactly. they're really smart about it. And a lot of that comes from experience, right? You you, you learn. You've you, been screwed by a, a punctured, you know. I have drug a crosscut saw across my pad before yeah. and ruined it. I yeah. have drug a chainsaw chain across. And so then you learn that lesson for however many more nights you're out there. And then we just oh. And then you're really careful the next time. That's how it works. Mm-hmm. Well. Weirdly, a lot of people, not, I shouldn't say weirdly, interestingly, interestingly, um, a lot of people think that a pad is for comfort. Mm-hmm. It is not. Mm. That is a side benefit. It's a fringe benefit. The fringe benefit. A pad is to insulate you against the ground. Perfect. Um, a ground is an enormous heat sink. 
Ah. The ground was always colder than your human body is, no matter so what. So what you, you want to do is put a protective layer between the two. You need an insulating layer between you or the ground, Perfect. or you will not be able to sleep at night. Perfect. Um, trust me. I've okay. Tried. Okay. So get a pad. Get okay. a pad. And that goes for sleeping in a hammock too. You want a pad underneath you. You on want the ground. a pad underneath you, underneath you, inside that hammock. Great. Because otherwise, there's just that strip of nylon, ah. and then there's nothing, and you will get very cold in the night, and you will not sleep. So. I wasn't even going to talk about hammocks, which is silly because at DanFriendMate.com we sell hammocks, um, and they're great hammocks, and they're double hammocks. So you could have two people, but for one person, they're perfect. Um, mm-hmm. And you you, um, you want to put a pad in there too. I still use an insulating pad in a hammock. Okay, that's a great tip. Mm-hmm. So um, so we've covered the, the bag, the shelter, um, the, uh, the insulation, which mm-hmm. is the pad. So then you're going to need, obviously you need food and water. Um, Water's heavy. Uh, food, not so heavy. You can get a lot of high-calorie food. Mm-hmm. It's pretty light. And and really, I, I wouldn't even... Um, I don't even want to spend too much time on the actual food because I think there's a lot of options out there. Oh, yeah. Just, just look for trail food, hiking food. I mean, trail mix is literally from the trail. You know? Yeah. Everybody um, knows trail mix, even if you don't hike. Uh, chocolate and nuts are very calorie-dense, high in fat. Yeah. It's everything that you need. Yeah. And so um, just make sure you have enough for about 3,000 calories per day. Uh, Depending on what you're doing, yeah, that's about right. But you're going to be doing um, strenuous activities, so you want more than your normal diet. Yeah, yeah. and I, I would say that do not neglect salty snacks. Um, you're going to be sweating a lot throughout the day, um, mm-hmm. and if you're not replacing that salt, uh, you're going to get a really bad headache. Okay. Um, or, you know, it goes down from there. But you're going to want to make sure, because you're going to be drinking liters and liters and liters of water because you're yeah. hot, you're moving around. Um, you need something salty. Cool. So liters and liters and liters of water sounds really heavy. So how do you bring the water you bring or don't bring? And what do you bring to hold your water? Um, A reservoir? Yeah. First thing, um, if I'm leisure camping and not doing it for a job anymore, um, I don't like to camp when there's not a water source. Um, I prefer to camp near a stream or a river or a lake. I bring water filtration with me, um, and then I bring a bladder inside my pack to hold about two to three liters of water. Okay. Um, so I can, with a hose, with a, uh, a bit piece, so I can drink while I move. Yeah. Um, but as I, I prefer to stay near water as much as I can. Yeah. Um, and that way there's no concern about running out of water, because I'll just top off whenever I need it with my water filtration. So you hike um, and camp near running water. I prefer to. Yeah. Um, it's it's easier for a myriad of reasons, sure. um, and it's just more pleasant. Uh, I agree. I mean, I like having water around. Yeah, it's it's nice to listen to while you're falling asleep. Um, sure. Also, trees tend to grow a lot closer to water, so you get more shade. Never be low shade. Yeah, yeah, that's right. More um, trees to tie your hammock to. And or if it's berry else. season, there's always berries nearby. Perfect. So you'll start with some water in your pack because you're yep. not starting near a stream, and then the rest of it you bring a filter. And then you um, you have a reservoir mm-hmm. and maybe even a water bottle like this one here that we carry from Matador. I actually um, always bring a water bottle with me. Which picture this this particular bottle folds down flat and then you can just fill it with water and it does have a bit piece at the top. Mm-hmm. And you always bring a water bottle with you in addition to your reservoir. I do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. So why do you do that? Um. So the reservoir is kind of a pain in the donkey to uh, drink out of when you're wandering around after you set up camp. Okay. Um. Some people don't mind it. It's not my favorite thing in the world. You're literally carrying like a, a, a giant lima bean kind of bladder. Basically, yeah. It's like carrying a big... A bagpipe, almost. Yeah. A, <laughs> you're carrying a bagpipe full of liquid. And then you're drinking out of it. Yeah, yeah. So um, this is much cooler to have. It's much cooler. Uh, bladders tend to be rather thin and prone to puncture. Also... So if you're wandering around with it in camp yeah, um, at night or time. nearby a fire, yeah. it's a very easy thing to damage and it's a critical resource. Redundancy. Redundancy. Okay. Um the, a water bottle is nice because, going back to salty snacks, I actually bring powdered Gatorade with me. Oh, okay. And once I get into camp, I'll actually put the powdered Gatorade in my water, uh, bottle. water bottle and then fill it up in my reservoir of, or from wherever I'm camped near. And then I've got a small water bottle to drink out of, yeah. replace my electrolytes. It's also just more pleasant to drink out of, yeah, yeah, I've yeah. found. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Um, this is why we're asking. Yep, and if something happens to my very small water bottle, I do have my reservoir as a backup just in case. 100% redundancy. Mm-hmm. Completely agree. Versus if you're going to spend half a day hiking away from a stream to yeah. get back to your vehicle or to your campsite to yeah. where there's water, yeah. this might not 
cover that distance versus your reservoir will. So your reservoir is your primary. This is the nice to have. Not the, right. And not the thing the you want to have with you when you're walking around, not yeah. typing. Mm -hmm. And so something like this, Advanced Primate, I think this is uh, $30, uh, which, you know, is more expensive than, um, it's really not. You know, Yetis and Stanley mm -hmm. and Flats, they're all more expensive than that. And this is a really nice piece. will serve that purpose um, as your backup to your water bladder and um, your, your piece that you might use on camp. So yeah. I actually enjoy that this is collapsible because this isn't something I would use until I set camp. Exactly. So, so you're this packing point, it the whole time. Yeah, I would roll that up and pack it. Yeah. And then when I got to camp, I would... Roll it and use it. Unroll it and then use it, yeah. Unfurl it. Unfurl. <laughs> um, so uh, when you get to camp, and we're sort of, I want to talk about the, the whole setting up camp, but I want to make sure we get all this stuff first. So you need things like a, a cook set. Um, so if you're going to cook something that needs to be mm -hmm. heated over a fire, maybe you yes. have, um, you have um, your, your like jet foil or your, your, mm -hmm. your fuel with you. Um, and then you, you need some sort of mess kit. I mean, obviously, I feel like spork, uh, may not have been invented for um, hiking or, or backpacking, but it certainly is like a perfect mm -hmm. kind of utensil because it's a two-in-one, three-in-one. You can even have a knife on the other side of it, so it's like a, a three-in-one. Um, yeah. So you're going to need utensils, but then you're also going to need um, the fuel canister, uh, toiletries, and probably a first aid kit of some kind. Always bring a first aid kit. Yeah, and what needs to be in the first aid kit? Like, obviously, you're carrying it in and out, so you don't mm -hmm. want a huge one, but like, what's the bare minimum? Well, um, in a first aid kit, there are things that you're definitely going to want to bring with you. Um, I would always expect blisters, especially on your first time. Um, when I go out at the beginning of a season, I've been, I drive a desk for a living. Yeah. Uh, I wear a tie. Um, <laughs> so at the beginning of the backpacking season, I'm going to get blisters. It's part of the job. It's, it's part, part of part it comes in the territory. It's part of the experience. Yeah. Um, uh, moleskin or, um. Something to put over your blister yeah. um, is a definite must. Uh, athletic tape, definite must. Okay. So um, like the white tape? Yep, the white tape. Yeah. Uh, depending on your level of comfort with first aid, um, we can get into a lot of different things that can be in a first aid kit. Yeah. Um, bring something for burns, uh, like burn cream, mm -hmm. um, something you want to make sure to bring a dressing yeah. um, for scratches or burns, something yeah. that you can put over to keep you know, bad stuff out, yep. put tape over that. Yep. Um, you want to bring something that can clean a wound. So, uh, like isopropyl alcohol. Yeah, would be yeah great. some sort of antiseptic. Antiseptic of some kind. Yeah. Um, if you are of legal age to drink, uh, whiskey. You can just pour your whiskey on it. Whiskey will do, but you're going to want to drink that. Um, Not that we're saying, but it would work in a pinch. It will. Yeah. Um, or tequila. Yeah. Um, <laughs> let's see here. What else should be in there? Um, aspirin or yeah. ibuprofen. Um, so, okay. Uh, let's see here. Uh, if you can, if you're comfortable with it, I would recommend bringing, um, they make small guides to first aid, like what to do step-by-step -step instructions. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so if, we have those on Advanced Prime. I didn't mm -hmm. bring one to show you. But you could bring a small guide, a pocket guide. Uh, a example. small pocket guide for just like basic steps. The um, one we sell actually tells you how to treat like a uh, shotgun wound. Yeah. Also, in case that happens. Yeah, and you know, even the most experienced people, um, nobody's immune to panic. And people do panic sometimes, and you forget steps, and it's nice to have written directions sometimes, even if you've done it a thousand times in practice. Sure. The very first time that somebody stops breathing on you, um, it changes it, the game a little bit it can be a little bit scary and sure you, it, and not that that's going to happen but you want to be mildly at least yeah. tiny bit prepared in case it does it, indeed so a small i mean these 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 kind of um, kits are available everywhere i mean really as far as like first aid kits go yes you just need a, a, the, the smaller kit um and then yep. potentially a pocket guide you could forego the pocket guide but that's another night that's another thing that you want to have it's a thing that's nice to have yeah yeah um but yeah, just be ready to deal with the sprains, abrasions, um, cool. twist ankles, that kind of fun stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can do, we can spend hours talking about basic survival, but really what we just want to do is make sure you have a little bit of tools with you um, to, to take care of mm -hmm. what ails you. Exactly. So food, we talked about water, we talked about uh, the other things you need. I don't, I don't really think there's, well, what about like a, like a defense? So like a bear spray or something like that, or um, and even more of a preemptive defense, 
like a bear canister to put your food in at nighttime mm-hmm. so you don't let the smells get out. What would you say? Either of those are something you would need to take on your first trip. It depends on where you're going if there's bears. Uh, uh, you need something to hide the smells. Yes. You need to be able to defend yourself. Unlikely if it's your first time. Yeah. Um, okay. So with regard to... I like that you brought up the preemptive defense. Mm-hmm. Um, with regard to food... 99.9% of the time, they, if there's an animal that's intruding in your area, that's bothering you, becoming a menace, yeah. it's because they want your food. Um, so if you take care of your food properly, you're not going to have a problem. Yeah. Um, in all my time uh, in the in the job sites, I have I have never run into a bear in a negative way. Um, it's usually a bear that didn't hear me coming while I was walking. Um, but I've generally been, we're all the same. We don't want to mess with them. They don't want to mess with us. They, they are giant raccoons. They yeah. do not want to mess with you. They're actually scared of you. Uh, uh, they'll usually run away when yeah. they notice you. Yeah. Um, unless you made a mistake, which is, you know, not proper food care. Yeah. So if they, if they want your food and they're in your camp at that point, bear spray is handy. Uh, loud noises are really, really handy. So you can bang on your mess kit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, bang two rocks together, shout. Yeah. Um, that'll chase the bear away. Yeah. Um, unless it's a grizzly. Yeah. Uh, then bear spray is your friend. Yeah, and yeah, also yeah. play dead. There's a, we'll get into that later. Yeah, yeah. Whole, whole other, yeah. probably separate video. Separate video. Um, I have never run into a grizzly bear. Um, and let's just keep it that way. And I would prefer to keep it that way. Yeah. Um, they've got their place, I've got mine, sure. and I like it that way. Sure. Um, bear canisters are wonderful for keeping food smells away. Yeah. Um, you can also bear hang as well. Let's let's take a small quick break. Oh, small break. Let's see. Oh, you're oh, just sleeping. In you go. I just know that when you're watching the video, you're gonna hear the you're gonna hear that heavy breathing. Yeah. Okay. Sounds like there's an unconscious person behind me. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. So uh, bear canisters are good. Sorry, we had to take a short break there. Mm-hmm. Bear canisters are good. Um, find them a lot of places the point is just that it's a it's a container you can put food mm-hmm. in and and your waste that would smell also and yes. you seal it so that there's no smell that gets out so let's wrap that part up and keep going but what, yeah. what would you say to close that um all i'd say is i'm glad that you brought up things that uh wastes as well because anything that doesn't smell like a tree or dirt smells like food so your chapstick smells like food um your don't bring your chapstick really yeah your toiletries I mean, you could bring your toilet your toiletries to go in there not Maybe bring your chapstick if you need it and you lose your chap. Yeah. But it's small. But, but when you're going to you're going it's to not see, dirt or trees. Yeah. It's going to smell like food no matter what it is. Um, so if you bring your chapstick, I bring chapstick with me. Um, <laughs> so forget that I said don't bring chapstick. Hey, you cannot bring chapstick. I don't use chapstick. That's uh, but uh, when I go to sleep at night, I put my chapstick with the food because of, to an animal it smells like food. And they will get into your tent. They will tear a hole in it. Yeah. Um, it's, they're hungry. They yeah. Snack. I mean, and the raccoon or squirrel that got into your tent to get your chapstick, they're not going to hurt you. But now, if it rains, you've got a big hole inside of your tent that nobody right. wants. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and it's a super highway for more squirrels. So bring a, a bear canister. Yep. Uh, bring a bear canister or a bear hang would be perfect. Yeah, hang it too. Yeah. Uh, so we talked about. I mean, so probably the only other thing that we really should cover here is is um well let's talk about setting up camp just high level and then uh, we probably should talk about uh, defecating going to the bathroom mm-hmm. real brief um and then and then i'd like to close this out with uh, kind of a few of the you know basic leave no trace principles mm-hmm. so so let's talk about setting up camp you got there you got all the stuff you brought it mm-hmm. in um i think we covered everything so before we set up camp, I'm just going to go through the list, and if I forgot anything, say it, but we're going to make the list easy because we talked around it uh, for a little bit. So you need navigation. You need a compass and a map, and you should have a backup to your cell phone, with, which means an actual compass and an actual map. Um, you need lighting. Uh, a headlamp is perfect. This keeps your hands free um, and it lights up what you need to see. Uh, sun protection is always important. I don't know that we mm-hmm. talked about sun protection, but if you're in a shaded area, it's not that important, but it's always good to not burn. So sun protection is important. Uh, we also didn't talk about a knife. Everybody should probably have some sort of... Bring a knife. Yeah, bring a knife. Um, any kind of knife that's sharp enough to cut what you need is fine. Mm-hmm. Um, we talked about shelter. 
Uh, we talked about creating fire, and that could be waterproof badges or lighter. Yeah. Yeah. I would say do yourself a favor and don't bring a knife. Don't bring an overly complex knife. Um, so you don't need a leatherman. I actually own a leatherman that I bring with me. Um, but you're an expert. What I would say is, I'm worried about the Swiss Army knives that are like this wide. Sure. Um, with a lot of things on there that are on one axle. Yeah. Uh, I would bring a folding knife. Yeah. Um, I mean, you could bring it double bladed. Uh, yeah. Traditional. The, the Leatherman that I bring, um, I can access the knife with my thumb from the outside without opening the whole instrument. Perfect. Yeah. Um, which I prefer. It's got a carabiner clip on it, so I can clip it to something, so I don't lose it. Yeah. yeah. I've lost so many knives out of my pockets yeah, that yeah, I just yeah. I clip them to everything so that they don't fall out. We have some great options at advancedarmate.com yep. for knives. So, you, so bring a knife. Nothing superly complex. Hopefully something you can strap on with a carabiner. Yep. Uh, water bottle. We talked about two kinds of water bottles. You want a bladder, and then you want a bottle you can walk around the camp with, like this Matador one here that we sell at advancedarmate.com for $30. Um, you also want to bring filtration because you don't want to pack all your own water in. You want to camp next to a water source. Mm -hmm. um, you don't necessarily need bear spray. It's better to have a bear canister. Keep all your food. Everything is food except for dirt and water and trees. So anything else that you bring that smells, put it in there. Um, sleeping bag and pad, mess kit, cooking kit, um, dual canister if you want, or you can start a fire if you, if you have that. Fuel canister is much easier. Yeah. And depending on um, where you are, yeah. if you cannot have a fire inside of a ring, sure. most places, if that's the case, will still allow you to use a cooking stove. Yeah, so, so. so bring a, a fuel canister, which is a very small cooking stove you've seen before. Mm -hmm. um, and then first aid. So in your toilet, you need to brush your mm -hmm. teeth. Um, we're going to talk about uh, whether or not you should have toilet paper in a second. So those are the things you need to have. Uh, so setting up camp. So you, you've hiked all day. You finally yep. found the perfect spot. Um, you know, some basic tips for setting up camp. You don't want to put your head down grade. Right? No. I mean, things, mm -hmm. things like that. So let's spend a few minutes talking about setting up camp. Yeah. Um, a lot of it's, it, it seems self-explanatory until you mess it up. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, true of most things I've found. Yeah, yeah, try to find like level ground that's not bumpy. Uh, always check the area for anything sharp like sticks and rocks before you put your tent down. You don't want to tear your tent, you want to puncture your sure. your pad. Sure. Um, or you just don't want to wake up with a rock or a rent in your shoulder blades yeah, at right, 3 yeah. in the morning. Yeah, yeah. Um, shade's nice. Um, if the situation allows for shade. Yeah. Uh, try to find an area that's already been impacted. So if you can tell if the area's already been flattened or it looks like somebody's Done slept there before, before yeah. that might be a good place to put your tent. Yeah. Um, because that plays, at that point you're minimizing the impact of the area because sure. now you're concentrating in one smaller space than, you know, uh, distributing the impact. Uh, okay. do so, your, do your best to look for dead trees. You don't want to sleep anywhere where a dead tree can fall on you. Which could happen while you're there. And with my luck, it would. So, yeah. uh, that's a good thing to look for. Um, what other big things do you have to be concerned about? I mean, if you're, so you put your tent, you yeah. know, in a place like that, um, if you're gonna have a fire, um, you don't want to put the fire underneath something else that might catch on fire. Yeah, you just want to look up, and make sure that there's not, you know, a tree above you. You want nice open sky. Sure, sure. Um, a lot of places that are backpacking destinations, especially along water sources. Yeah. You run into areas where people have been before, and you'll probably run into a fire ring. There's a circle. Right. Yeah, just use the ring that's already there. It's already an impacted circle. Yeah. Don't use your own rocks. Okay, that, that, don't, don't reinvent the wheel. Don't try and get cute, basically. Yep. If it's already there, it's been done by somebody who's, I mean, lots of somebody's, and it, yep. and it works. So, um, Yeah, and just double check. Double check the work. Make sure that the ring isn't underneath oh. overhanging branches and things like that. Pitch your tent and set up and yeah. have a nice sleep. Just find a place that uh, makes you happy. And don't let the sounds mess with you too bad. As, as long as you put everything away. That's where the water comes in. Yeah. It drowns out the sounds. <laughs> Perfect. So camp next to a water source for a myriad of reasons. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna to have to go to the bathroom when you're out there in the wild, is that right? Yes. I mean, you might not have to pee that much because you're you know, you're gonna be burning through the water. Um, I have heard many doctors say that most people poop. <laughs> I think that's true. So this is probably one of the biggest things people don't want to talk about, or that they might be worried about when they go into the wilderness for the first time to do something like this. Um, and you want to. And this is really rooted in the Leave No Trace, and there are seven principles of Leave No Trace, and there's a lot of good stuff out there on it. And we'll touch on those seven principles, but for pooping in the woods, because peeing is pretty straightforward, uh, what do you do? Best practices. Best practice. Number one, um, you want to be about 200 feet away from water. Um, 200 feet. Pace it off mm -hmm. if you have to. 
you know, I really have to do that, but it's a little ways. I mean, it's almost a, two thirds of a football field. Uh, yeah, it's about 70 or 80 of my legs, my strides, depending. There you go. It varies. Um, Your mileage may vary. Yeah, mileage will vary. I've got short legs. <laughs> uh, you want to dig a hole? Um, we tend to call them cat holes because it's a small hole in the ground. You want to bury it um, about as deep as you can go without digging a trench. Um, if it is just you or you're just there for the night, uh, a single-use hole is just fine. Um, if you're going to be there for a while or you're there with a larger group of people, um, digging a latrine is actually a really good idea because, again, it's going to concentrate your impact into a specific small area rather than impacting the entire area around um, Megan spreading your mess everywhere. Yeah, rather than you want to minimize having, your impact. Yeah, rather than having human feces everywhere, we've got one small area with a very deep latrine that we've dug. You know, yeah. it could be two, three feet deep. Yeah. And in that case, that, that all that waste is in one spot versus scattered all over where someone might find it, or an animal's going to dig it up, or. So you want the animals to dig in one hole, not all of them, because mm -hmm. they probably will dig it up. They will. Yeah. So gross, but hey, that's how it works. That means nature is what we're trying to get into here. If you if you so. bury it deep enough, it might stay down there. Yeah. We're, we're actually losing light here. Yes. So hopefully this is still um, visible. I think it's probably okay, and we'll lighten it up if we have to. So um, let's talk about toilet paper, mm -hmm. because that's what everybody's <laughs> thinking about right now is toilet yes. paper. Yes. And I know you know that you probably shouldn't bring it in, because if you bring it in, you got to bring it out, and that's gross. So what do you think about that? Don't bring toilet paper unless you have a medical reason to bring it. I didn't say it, he did, but I agree. Um, I'm glad that you said pack it out. Uh, do If you bring toilet paper, if you absolutely have to bring toilet paper, do not bury it. It doesn't belong out there. Um, bring a plastic bag. I know it's gross because we're a culture that likes to put our our waste in the toilet and then pretend like it doesn't exist. It's gone. And flush it. It's gone. Well, it is. Um, I mean, as far as I can tell, it's gone. Yep, it's gone. But that's not how it works. No, no it's not how that works at all. Yeah. Um, you want to put your toilet paper that you've just used, and you want to put it in a Ziploc bag. Yeah. And it's nasty, <laughs> but that's going to live in your backpack. Totally. Um, there are many things that you can use in place of toilet paper. Uh, let's, let's do them in order of preference. Just let's do top five. Oh. Or three. Five's a lot. Let's do three. Uh, I would say broad leaves. Broad, thick leaves. So leaves with um, a lot of very prominent veins in them. You want to get that uh, the ridges. The catch. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. We don't want to get too, too detailed here, but I mean, this is serious. Yep. Okay, so leaves are number one. Um, That's number two. Leaves are number one. Um, <laughs> obviously, we're going down. No pun intended. What's yeah. the second option? <laughs> uh, as we go down the scale, smaller leaves are less, are less ideal, but they'll work. Leaves are the number one option. Leaves are the number one option. Um, the broader, the better. The ridgier, the better. Okay. Um, Obviously, the less dry, the better, because the less likely to crinkle and oh, leave, you, leave you in a lurch. The so stories I could tell you. That's, that's um, for another video. Another video. Yeah. Uh, after that, we've got... Pine cones? I would prefer a nice uh, flat rock, actually, as oh. an option number two. Okay. Um, so, obviously, the size of the rock needs to be about palm size, maybe. I mean, and you, you can probably figure this out for yourself. Yeah. But, but really, what kind of rock are you looking for? So the joy so of... So flat, like a, like a river rock almost, right? Yeah, something with a good edge on it. Um, river rocks are okay. Uh, if you can find an angular rock, like a piece of granite or a basalt, that's really nice. Um, yeah. Those work. You can grab a couple with you. Um, you can bury them. Um, if, you're not in a, if you're in a boulder field or something like that, burying is not an option. Yeah. You can leave them on top of a nice flat boulder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> sure. So rocks are number two. Rocks are number two. What's the third one? Pine cone. The direction of the pine cone that you wipe is important. It's very important. And we're it just going to leave it there. You can figure it out. Yep. Go the smooth way. Um, um, Doug for pine cones work best. Okay. Doug, um, Douglas fir. Yep, they are. Yep, Douglas Prominent fir. in Idaho. Uh, really, most of the Northwest. Yeah. In California. They're they're yeah. small, softer cones. They, it's a uh, Christmas tree. I mean, really. It's a yep. very popular Christmas tree. Mm -hmm. At least uh, around here. They're they're wonderful trees. They're one of my favorites. They are. Yeah. Um, so use their pine cones. Yep. They're 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 very small. They tend to be softer, and the direction matters. Doesn't matter. So uh, let's talk about. So you've gone in, you've camped, uh, you've had a great time, you've, you're hydrated, you've got enough calories, you've eaten food, everything. Uh, you wake up in the morning and you pack up your tent, you repack your bag. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's talk a little bit about leave no trace because one of the most 
important things you could possibly do is, is leave it better than you found it. As be, uh, being a person that, that ventures into the wilderness and nature and life authentic. Um, so there's seven principles, um, but let's just let's just leave it. You know, pack it out, right? And, mm -hmm. if, and if you find some extra, somebody else left something there, and you can pack it out, do that. I mean, that's mm -hmm. what would you say to that, Tim? And then, I mean, this is really the last main thing we're gonna probably talk. Yeah, uh, really. Well, what I prefer to do, and what I do when I go back back with my friends, is we'll actually kind of grid it out, yeah. and we'll stand, you know, arm width apart, and just walk back and forth in a grid fashion over where we were, and look for anything that we might have dropped, anything we might have scuffed or discarded on accident. Um, if we find something that somebody else has left behind, we pack that out. I always bring a trash bag with me, and that sits right on the very top of my pack, so I can get to that quickly. And, yeah, uh, we try to get anything out of there that doesn't belong. That's awesome. You make a grid with the people you're with. Yep. And you make an organized, take an organized approach, almost like an archaeologist a little bit. We, yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Taking one foot by one foot squares. It's, it's not that quite that detailed. But uh, when I was working with the kids, I used to give them a. I had a candy bar at the nearest. I buy them a candy bar at the nearest uh, gas station. Sure. Uh, for the kid who found the most pieces of trash. Perfect. Incentivize your kids. Yes. That's a great lesson there too. And you'd be surprised at the amount of trash they were able to find in some places. Because there's only one candy bar. Yep. So the best one wins. So cool. So literally leave no trace and take that very seriously. Um, there's one thing that we want is we want more people to be able to enjoy the outdoors. Um, especially in times like these where it's really the only place you can go and, and enjoy yourself. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's better for, uh, I mean, there's so many studies on it. It's better for the economy. Uh, it's better for your personal well-being. It's better for your health. It's good exercise. Um, mentally, um, there are studies that show that people are better off mentally mm -hmm. uh, when they're able to be in the wilderness more often. I mean, there are so many benefits. And, and the one thing that we can all do to not um, you know, to do our part and make sure that this is around for everybody else that comes after us um, is to pick up at least what we bring and, and more. I mean, for, do your part. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, please. I mean, and it's something to be passionate about and it's something you should care about. Um, and this isn't like work for me to say. I really believe it. And I think you, you, you do too, or you will after you go out and you live it and you see it and you're like, oh, that's, that's too bad that somebody did that. So you know, definitely pick mm -hmm. up after yourself when you're out there. And, um, and so then you've, you've done that, and then you hike back. Yep. Um, and you get back to the trailhead. And that, is that it? Is that the end? Then what? What do you do when you get done with a backpacking trip? Most important post-trail step. This is it right here. This is the payoff. Food. <laughs> what kind of food? The, I say follow your joy. For me, it's the greasiest hamburger that I can find. And you've earned it. You've earned it. So five guys, uh, in and out. Uh, if you have a gourmet burger that's local to where you're at, mm -hmm. um, five guys is not local to Idaho, but they do use Idaho potatoes. And if you've ever been to one, I don't care where it is, it tells you what place in Idaho your potatoes came from. Uh, and five guys is delicious, but it is guilt food unless you've just gone backpack. Mm -hmm. Or find, morning, your... find a scone the size of your head. <laughs> you're gonna thank me with a big old side of bacon. <laughs> that sounds awesome. It is. So. The end of your backpacking trip should be um, as deck, well, it's more decadent, but as as amazing as the backpacking trip itself. Indeed, in the food that you get as a mm -hmm. reward for, I don't know. It's almost like it feels like too good to be true. I mean, you had a great time outside. Mm -hmm. You you left it better than you found it. You got all this exercise. You ate the right amount of calories, and you probably got more healthy than when you left. And then you get to be rewarded with. A really delicious meal that's probably not that good for you, but because you were just so good and healthy, it's okay. <laughs> and that's the best part about it. Yeah. There's something to be said about maintaining your mental health through food. That is right. So backpacking, um, if you're new to the sport uh, or the uh, lifestyle or the uh, adventure, uh, we welcome you. Um, it's been a pleasure to be able to sit down here and thank you for watching and talk with Tim S., this is also Tim S. I'm Tim Shipper with AdvancedPrimate.com, your outdoor retailer for backpacking, hiking, and camping. This is Tim Smith, and uh, he's our resident expert, and uh, we'll be back to do more of these. And uh, again, thanks again for watching, and uh, any closing words, Tim? Thank you. Happy hiking. <laughs> See you, everybody.